prosecution tool is one of the important things to want to pass to you. We want the benefit to support people who are trying to pass on the great stuff. We've got a number of activities for you this evening, and I'll just introduce them as we go through, rather than introducing them all at the end of the time. There is one speaker missing, John McCarthy from the Black Triangle Disability Rights Group, and he's on a train, and he'll be here from about 8 o'clock. So when John comes in, we'll give him his 10 minutes. There's two bits of paper then, which we have a whole lot of fair to as we go through the meeting with the speaker, then we'll more refer to. And we've got both the white sheets of paper. One is the title to all tonight's Glasgow Anti Bedroom Tax Meeting, which is a, a statement of support from our colleagues and comrades in the WD. We're having similar meetings like this um, um, up in that part of Scotland. And as you probably know, meetings like this are happening across, across Scotland and indeed probably across the UK as well. The second bit of paper we've got is entitled Bin the Bedroom Tax Meeting, Wednesday the 13th of March. And that essentially is a which will be moved by the speakers on behalf of the respective groups um, and together as, as the speaker of the next week um, to really do a number of things which we'll touch on as we go through. One of the things we want to leave this meeting with is something a bit more supported, making sure that those who are directly affected by this, no other folk are looking out for them and there's other people who are going to support them. We also want to leave with some practical actions about what we're going to do and how we can try and campaign to get rid of this uh, tax, uh, which is affecting uh, 100,000 people in Scotland and at least 15,000 households in Glasgow. I won't go through all the numbers because we know a lot of this and the speakers will all refer to it themselves. We intend to finish the meeting maybe about, uh, about 9 o'clock, so we've got about an hour and a half or so. If you are looking at the clock, don't look at that clock because we've we never changed the battery in that this afternoon. If you turn around, you'll see a clock in the back, but I'll keep that. In terms of domestic arrangements, the toilets are here. There's a, an, an accessible toilet here. There's gents toilets down the stairs and the ladies toilets is just the first on the right hand side. There's no fire alarm point. There's a fire alarm goes off the front door and across the, the, the road to the, to the rustic points and some of the, the, the shop stewards will call and assist you for the assistance. So I'm just going to um, kick off by asking my first speaker to speak, who is Nicola Crawford, who has been doing uh, work in the south side. Um, area of Glasgow round about organising public meetings and local events to do with the bedroom tax. And Nicola's going to see a wee bit of the high experience and suggest some, some ideas that other colleagues should be doing that. Okay, so welcome, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
es kommen kommt halt was zählen wir, ein Brom ist nicht. Aber ich sehe ab und zu Pes aus, bin da wo kämpfst du, eine Kämpfer stehst du nicht. Der Schaum schaut von Pes, wenn der Erzähl mit Senko X, wo da ist ohne Optik nach fort. Er hat einen Brom, die Brom nicht bei Senko X, das ist nicht bei der S. Wenn der Pippen Tag kommt in die Play, people have two choices. So either peel them in, or go, and then go hungry, or go. Or you won't peel them in, and then you'll face affection. If you play by their rules, you cannot win. You just cannot win. So I would suggest that we make our own rules up and be fighting. I'm not a member of a political party. I'm not a, a trade unionist. I'm not a member of a political movement or organisation. I'm, I'm not a socialist.
finish off by what happened in the last 24 hours. The government made a lot of concessions in the last 24 hours. Uh, a lot of them have been good. The reason that they've made concessions is because we put on pressure. We, you, 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 you. You go to MSPs, you go to newspapers. You've made a difference. Now, if, if we can do that, then we work together. If you go back home, speak to your friends, your neighbours, get your community involved, we can stop this. And not only that, I truly believe that we can put people back into politics. Thank you. You might not be a politician or end a political party, but you certainly destroyed a lot of the Tories' arguments there, Alan, and your contributions, so I think that was, that was good. I think Alan makes a point which I think most people who are involved in the trade union movement or within uh, political organisations is that the bedroom tax and the worst excesses of the welfare reform will go be defeated just by their folk because there's not enough. It needs to go wide on that to the idea of people, to working class people, about how we then work on common ground to try and then get, have a, a mass campaign to try and oppose this and that's, that's why it's so good. There's, there's even more people came in with the door they were probably getting close to 100 people have to see. Um, so uh, that, that's really important. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Gary Burns. Gary's from the Govan Law Centre and Alan uh, referred to some of the work that the work in the Govan Law Centre have been doing um, and there's a point in your, uh, the motion which is in front of you which talks about a petition which is in front of the, the Scottish uh, government, the Scottish Parliament at the minute, um, and I'll let uh, Gary uh, see what the, the government law says for that idea and plans are going about that. So, Gary Burns for the government law says. Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to see everybody in here in such a packed room. I'm going to do a seat, so I guess if folk are standing up, they know I'm okay with that. Um, I'd just like to first of all thank Alan for the work he's done over the last couple of months in bringing not only this room together, but various meetings across the west of Scotland, eh, particularly given that, that, that Alan's doing this off his own back. I have a professional interest in this because I've decided to get into work from homelessness and by proxy, I have to be here. Alan's supposed to do this off his own time and I think that the passion he talks about and the facts that he talks about for the next months, which is pretty embarrassing. <coughs> eh, my role in the mother is a professional homelessness case worker and I've previously worked for the Community in Barnabas and the Homeless the Street Outreach team. I've worked with some homeless people for about five or six years, and in my experience of working with homeless people, it's, it's no choice that people need to become homeless. It's part of their journey in their life where risk taking behaviour or outside events, bad luck, or a combination of all these theories culminate in somebody becoming homelessness. The bedroom tax is going to increase homelessness across the UK, and this is happening through people not making any choices going to be forcing people who never thought they were going to be in court, who never thought they were ever going to become homeless, become homeless and have to stand up in court. The bedroom tax, as this has been coined, and don't let the defenders of this policy detract from the argument based on the semantics of what it's called, is going to impact on about 100,000 people in Scotland and 600,000 in the UK. Around two thirds of these people are disabled, a person for living with them is disabled. Many of these people are out of work for a long time and are struggling to find work. So again, this is not about a choice. The bedroom tax impacts going to, signif is going to impact significantly on people's ability to pay their rent, culminating in landlords and social landlords having the potential to evict. You know, see they work to <coughs> on purpose because the registered social landlords don't have to evict. They choose to evict. <coughs> some are, uh, some uh, Social landlords have stated that they won't evict those who accrue arrears with the bedroom tax, although they tend to be councils who, when they do evict, will then pick up the, the, the payment for what it is when they become homeless, so they're kind of saving a bit of money at the same time. Um, sorry, I'm not used to speaking publicly, so give us a moment, please. <coughs> we have to be careful, though, not to turn this into a battle with social landlords, councils, and tenants. Because no one wants this tax, but everybody's going to have to deal with it. And part of what the kind of Tories are doing is to turn tenants against their social landlords, to turn social landlords against their tenants, and turn council against everybody. We currently have a petition in the Scottish Parliament asking that the legislation is changed in Scots law to keep the bedroom tax element of any rent arrears as ordinary debt. This legislation is in order to protect tenants and shouldn't be looked at in isolation. 
Ook overigens kan ik dat ook bij helpen, is een kost tegen social landlords in this. There's also a cost for social landlords to evict, which Alan's already touched on. We would also say that land social landlords have a, a duty of care to their tenants because they're charities. They've been set up to support, protect, and look after their tenants. The, the, the government law centre's petition is not about people not stopping and paying their rent. <coughs> it's to challenge what everyone in this room and everyone across Scotland and, every, and most people across the UK, apart from Tories, say is wrong. And if it's wrong, we should be stopping it. And the Scottish Parliament has a power to do so. There's some, been some recent developments that you may have heard of in the news. One, one of them which you may not have heard is that uh, there's been advice released for the, the, the part of the to the government about severely disabled children, where local authorities make a decision on that household as to whether they can have a room or not, based on their, their child's disability. This has just came out, you know, about three hours before I came into work, so we've not had a proper look at it. But from what we can gather, it's that if people can make submissions to the local authority to have an extra room if their child is severely disabled. There was also some stuff said from uh, Ian Duncan Smith about foster parents in the military. Th th this is a smoke scheme. The, the, the foster parents are, are a very, very small element of who's going to get impacted by this. Also, the guidance when it was brought out from the very beginning said that the local authorities must set aside money and give it to, be, give it to the, the foster parents. So it's a bit of a smoke screen to make it look as if the Tories are changing their mind at the last minute. That they're listening to people. And there may be further caveats that the, the Tories bring forward. I would urge you not to trust them because... These caveats are going to make it look like they've listened when the vast majority of people are still going to be hit by this bedroom tax, but it's going to make them look more lenient. The Tory government are stating that these reforms are going to save about £500 million in welfare reductions. This is disputed by my organisation and many homeless and housing organisations across the UK. The, the idea is that private landlords will take up the majority in single person households because no registered social landlords have them. Now, this is not an automatic saving that is what's put forward by the Tories because private landlord rents are a lot higher than what they are for a two bedroom flat social landlord. So in many cases there won't be a saving, there will actually be an increase. The DWP have already stated in February last year that the, if everybody who's going to be affected by the bedroom tax moved, there would be no saving. So this idea that they're saying that this is about social mobility and putting people into the right signs is a nonsense. It's a sound thing, and the government are aware of this, but they continue to push it. There's then, of course, the costs that are associated with homelessness, which are likely not going to be cared about the Tories, but with people here speculating about, because not only the social aspect, there's a financial implication. Homelessness devastates individuals, families and communities. Presently, the homelessness system in Glasgow and across other local authorities are, 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 are busting. And this is going to put additional pressures where councils are going to have to pick and choose who they offer a service to. Other people who would be our most vulnerable people, the most chaotic, will be getting turned away to street in the streets. As I worked within the care sector, the best practice for me has always been to keep people out of the homeless system. This is going to become impossible with the bedroom tax. People who never ever thought they were going to be homeless now have the potential to become so. They didn't choose to have a disability, they didn't choose to have an autistic child, or mental ill health, or be out of work. Nobody chooses these things, these happen to you. It's easy for the Tories to label people as shirkers and lazy, but in the vast, vast majority of cases, this is just propaganda to justify the vile policy aimed at our most vulnerable in society. Homelessness has a direct impact on people accessing mental health services, addiction services, criminal justice, children missing school, other child protection issues, and a whole host of other social problems. I'm a pretty simple person, and if you're going to increase homelessness, then you're going to increase presentation for services. These services don't cost, they cost an awful lot of money, because it's professional supporting people. There's also a kind of follow-on impact, that, 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 and there's lots of different follow-on impacts, but I have a particular interest in this, because I also work for Bernardo's, and that's <coughs> young people just now who, who who are maybe leaving home for the first time, they're not going to be able to get the single birth housing association houses because they're going to be filled up by people sitting here or people who are in two bedroom flats. So young people are going to be forced to stay at home, whether that's good for them or not. I'm going to kind of finish up now to see what, what a response should be. There's already been a legal challenge placed which was successful today. Now the legal challenge 
wasn't one in the courts, although it went through the <coughs> legal challenge was one because the government withdrew their, 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 their dispute with it. That come, came because people in here and people in the streets were putting pressure on, newspapers were reporting on what was happening, <coughs> and they caved under that pressure because how on earth could they possibly say that two severely disabled children who, who, who can't share a room must? So that's been pressure from people like Alan and people sitting in here. They've changed that. The legal thing isn't enough though. What we need to do in here is learn about the bedroom tax, talk about it, tell your friends and your neighbours and your family about how unjust this is. Pressure the board of your housing association, contact the local councillor, write to the address, and most importantly, turn up to the march at the end of this month. This policy is illogical, and when you talk to people about it, they may have had some kind of support for it, because it makes sense why should somebody be in a big massive place when there's a housing crisis. But when you start breaking it down and explaining to them what the impact of this is going to be, I've not found anybody, including my one Tory friend, who was able to support it. So I would say contact people and, and, and get, get it out there, what we're all talking about tonight. And just to follow up from Alan, I think that everybody in here should tomorrow go to Glasgow City Council to make sure that this march leaves for George Square, because that's where square, that's no real square, it's for the people of Glasgow. <laughs> very much, uh, Gary, for, for that explanation and uh, commentary around about the, some of the legal um, issues to that, and I, I see John uh, just uh, coming to the front from, from the Black Triangle. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring in our, our next speaker, um, who is a uh, former MSP and Socialist campaigner, Tommy Sheridan, who clearly will have a number of ideas and experiences to draw from. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brian, and um, can I just thank each and every one of you for making the effort to come out tonight to this meeting, to hopefully start something off, to hopefully begin a campaign that can be just as successful as the campaign that started in Glasgow some 24 years ago when we started the anti-coal tax campaign against all the odds, because we were told then that there was nothing we could do. We were told then that we were facing the invincible. We were told then that the Iron Lady was all conquering. And after we got involved in a campaign, after we decided to fight and show a bit of guts, that the Iron Lady got melted down and put into the political nasty <laughs> shark. Hey. And I think we should take some confidence from the experience of that campaign, I had a wee head-to-head -head the other night on this Twitter. I'm new to it, so if any of you are on it and uh, I don't write it properly, it's because I'm new to it. But I had a wee bit of head-to-head -head with somebody who was trying to defend the SNP's government on this whole policy so far. And uh, the SNP are quite clear that they're opposed to the bedroom tax. There's no, there's no doubt about that, they're opposed to the bedroom tax. The SNP are saying if there was an independent Scotland, we wouldn't have a bedroom tax. Brilliant. I want an independent Scotland. Not everybody in here will share that opinion, but I want an independent Scotland. The problem is, brothers and sisters, we're not going to have an independent Scotland for at least another two years. What we need from the SNP government is not just commitments about what they would do in the future. What we need from the SNP government is action in the here and now. That's what we need from the SNP government. See this individual that was talking to me head to head we, we, we was trying to have a go at me. He said, Oh, why are you attacking the SNP? It's the Tories that are introducing the bedroom tax. I said, Look, don't be silly. I'm not attacking the SNP government for the bedroom tax. The bedroom tax is the work of these condemned brutes that will come on to you in a minute. But the SNP has it within its power to alleviate. The single biggest concern that exists as far as a byproduct of this bedroom tax is concerned. The single biggest concern is that people they have to be poor in the first place, they get housing benefit. So when we say it's an attack on the poor, we mean it's an attack on the poor. People who can hardly afford to make ends meet right now are going to be asked to find another 14 quid a week or another 25 quid a week 
depending on the number of bedrooms in their house. They simply cannot afford it. They simply cannot afford it and therefore they'll find themselves in rent arrears. Those rent arrears could lead to action in the Sheriff Court for evictions. And what the Govan Law Centre petition requests is that the Housing Scotland Act 2001 be amended to treat bedroom tax arrears as ordinary debt. It's not the be-all and end-all. By the way, it's not the end of the campaign. Because we should be campaigning for the wiping out of any debt that's accrued as far as bedroom tax is concerned. <laughs> but what do we do? What that simple amendment to the Housing Scotland Act would do is it would take away overnight the fear that hundreds of thousands of living in social housing have that if they can't pay their rent, they're going to be based with possible eviction. And I think the SNP government have a duty to stand up and be counted on this one. And I would go further. If the SNP are serious about winning a referendum next year, then why don't they put themselves at the head of this campaign and say, no way will we have any eviction? That would certainly, that would certainly I believe, help to convince some people who might just now be undecided about how they're going to vote. So this isn't, as I try to explain to this guy, this isn't about attacking the SNP. And he came back to me and he said, fights are won before they're started. <laughs> you need to arrange these things first. And I, I wrote back to him and said, well, you obviously were never involved in the anti poll tax campaign. Because we were told that we were just a bunch of upstarts. That we were irrelevant. We were irrelevant until a million people in Scotland refused to pay it. We were irrelevant until 14 million across England Wales in Scotland refused to pay it. We were irrelevant until John Major had to start up in Parliament and announced that the poll tax was being rescinded because it had became uncollectible. Who made it uncollectible? Ordinary working class folk, the length and breadth of this country made it uncollectible. In other words, that battle was won because people fought the battle. And we have got to say here tonight that the bedroom tax battle can be won, but only if we fight it. Only if we get organised. Only if we get the anger that exists out there and try and focus that anger, develop that anger and develop the campaign for lobbies, for meetings, for demonstrations, for occupations. And at the end of the day, let's be clear about it. There's a statement that you're going to be asked to vote on tonight. And that statement makes it clear. At the end of the day, one of the principal elements of this campaign has surely got to be that there will be no bedroom tax evictions. Just as we saw, just as we saw poll tax warrant sales, and remember a lot of us here were involved in that campaign, going to people's houses that you'd never met in your life, neighbours that you'd never met, going to different housing schemes, and standing outside the door of people who are threatened with poll tax pendings and warrant sales. We've got to say loud and clear that that campaign of human solidarity was able to prevent poll tax warrant sales. The bedroom tax campaign has to form similar walls of human solidarity that defends people from eviction because the poor and can afford to pay these extra taxes. You know, there is a context to this. A very important context. This has not been something that's plucked out of the air. This is part and parcel of the condemned government's brutal assault, brutal assault, on the living standards of ordinary working class folk designed to try and divide and conquer. This is part and parcel of the austerity package. What is austerity? But punishing the poor for the mistakes and the greed of the rich. That's what austerity is. That's what it represents. Ordinary working class folk 
never caused the economic crisis. We never get the banks into the mess that they're in. But the bankers and their political friends that refused to regulate them, they presided over an economic meltdown. And while they were benefiting with their multi-million pound bonuses and their telephone figure salaries and everybody else was struggling to get by, they didn't care. And then the banks went bust and they said, oh, we can't allow that. It's all right for coal mines to go bust. It's all right for steel yards to go bust. It's all right for shipyards to go bust. But we can't allow the banks to go bust. So they gave £1.2 trillion of taxpayers' money to stop the banks going under. We didn't have any money, but we found £1.2 trillion. <laughs> we are now expected to pay for that economic mess. We are expected to pay from a bunch of people who are out of touch with reality, who are out of touch with the ordinary lives of folk who we meet in our everyday lives. I branded them last week. I was on the radio on the Jeremy Vine show debating with some nugget. I can't even get his name right. He's bored or something. And I labelled them political space cadets. These are people who are actually suggesting that this bedroom tax is a chance to improve social mobility. This idiot was suggesting that perhaps people could take in lodgers. Oh. <laughs> I don't know about you. I spent most of my life in a top dancer of a tenement in Littlehall Road in Pollock where there were three bedrooms apparently and uh, the bedrooms were right next to each other and we had one wee toilet and one wee kitchen and I'm thinking to myself he's talking about taking in lodgers <laughs> <laughs> well that's alright if you're Lord David Freud one of the architects mm -hmm. of the bedroom tax Lord David Freud who's got a wee gaff in Kent <laughs> with eight right. bedrooms a, a palatial mansion. But by the way, does he spend most of his time there? He spends most of his time in a taxpayer subsidised townhouse in London with four bedrooms worth 1.9 million quid. And these are the people that are on the radio suggesting, well, these people are affected with the bedroom tax. It's taking lodgers. <laughs> <laughs> they live in a parallel universe. That's the reality. Yep. They don't know what they're talking about. How many of you would allow a mechanic to conduct heart surgery on you? <laughs> if you would they trust the mechanic to conduct heart surgery, why would you trust the Tories to introduce a social housing policy? <laughs> they would they know? <laughs> they would they know a council house if it fell in the heats? <laughs> And it's from that point of view, brothers and sisters, we've got to say loud and clear, this isn't just about the bedroom tax, it's about an overall assault on working class people and the living standards, it's about cutting wages, it's about cutting benefits, and it's about rank hypocrisy. You see, they tell us we're all in it together. What a lot of nonsense, we're all in it together. Well, if we're all in it together, why are the poor and the disabled getting a bedroom tax when 13,000 millionaires are getting a tax cut of 100,000 pounds. Yeah. If we're all in it together, if we're all in it together, why are they introducing a benefit cap but not a mansion tax? If we're all in it together, brothers and sisters, then why do you have a situation where we have MPs representing the condemned government and a cabinet of 29 people, 29 members of the cabinet, 23 of the 29 are millionaires. They're completely and utterly devoid of a sense of the reality of what their policies are actually doing. They are out of touch. These are people on wages of 66 grand a year who also qualify for a grocery allowance. A grocery allowance. 160 quid a week. 
Grocery allowance. The bloody job seekers allowance is worth £71 a week and you have to get all of your expenses for that. But these people in Parliament don't only get 65 grand as a wage, they get a wee extra, along with that with other expenses, of a grocery allowance of £160 a week. It is sick. Absolutely sick. And at the end of the day, we can rage all we want, but what we've got to do is turn our anger into action. We've got to adopt the slogan that we don't just get angry, we get organised. And that's why the motion tonight before you I think is important. I've attended scores of these meetings as has Alan. Alan and a group of his friends approached us several weeks ago to seek some advice from an old sage. <laughs> I think I was seen as a, a veteran, an OEP of the struggle. And Alan said, we want to fight it, can you give us some advice? And I've got to say I'm glad they've taken the advice and they've built the campaign. There are meetings taking place in every part of Scotland now. I've been invited to Irvine next week, East Kilbride the week after, Cardonald the week after, Castlemilk tomorrow night. There are meetings <coughs> taking place all over. Let's get congratulations right now to the Dundee campaigners that have sent us a message tonight. <laughs> the Dundee campaigners who have had meetings in the housing schemes of Dundee have put pressure on the council to listen to them and on Monday achieved a significant concession because Dundee City Council has now declared that there will be no evictions for at least the first 12 months after the bedroom tax is introduced. <laughs> what we would say about that, what we would say about that is number one, if Dundee City Council can give a commitment of a moratorium on evictions for a year, then so can the other 31 councils in Scotland give the same moratorium. <laughs> and the second thing we would say is if they can give a moratorium for 12 months, then what about 24 months? What about 36 months? In other words, let's use this not as a finish, but as a start, as an encouragement as far as our campaign is concerned. But if we're serious about securing victory on this. Part and parcel of the motion tonight is about getting a structure. It's about getting some organisation. I'm getting a wee bit worried about the amount of times you go on the social media, the Facebooks, the Twitters, and there's a demo on the 30th of March in Glasgow, and it starts at 10. No, no, it's 11. No, it's 12. And it's starting at the George Square. No, no, it's Glasgow Green. And then you go on to other signposts and other postings and there are demos in Edinburgh but they're not sure what time and where it's taking place. The truth of the matter is our enemies organised. They're very organised. We need to get ourselves organised. We need to be able to speak with a one voice that unites the campaign. If we can agree around the principles that are in the statement tonight, the principle of opposition to the bedroom tax, the principle of opposition to evictions resulting from the bedroom tax. The principle of arguing loud and clear that the SNP government should stand up and be counted in this one. If we can argue and agree around those points, then I would recommend a motion to you tonight, brothers and sisters. I hope that you'll support it. I hope that we can move forward to the demonstration on the 30th of March here in Glasgow. There's going to be one in Edinburgh. I hope we can make it a success. My personal opinion in relation to representation with the council, I've heard it before. I remember them telling me when I was trying to organise a demo against the Criminal Justice Act for the old heads in here, they'll remember that in those days. And the council says, you can't meet in George Square. I says, no, we're meeting in George Square. I says, no, you can't meet in George Square. I says, no, we're meeting in George Square. I says, no, you can't. I says, well, fine. We turned up and we met in George Square. And we marched to St Neil's. And you know, it strikes me, because apparently the council's talking about maybe a compromise would be St Neil's. 
Well, it strikes me that a perfect compromise would be meeting George Square and we march the city. <laughs> <laughs> because that way we march through the city centre and people can see us. Because yeah. the reason they want us to go to Glasgow Green is to put us out the way. They want us to put in a big park so nobody can see us. Right. I think we should begin in there and saying, hey, we're meeting in George Square, everybody in Glasgow knows where it is, and we're going to St. Enoch's and we'll have a rally there. It's our city. They don't own the city. They're only custodians for a wee while of it. And I think that's the way we get our message across. We're not going to hurt anybody. We're, not, we're going to have a non-violent protest. If they're not prepared to police it, we'll police it ourselves. But we're going to start in George Square and we're going to St. Enoch's. And I also think there's another event that we should try and mobilise for. It's going to be harder because it's midweek. But on the 27th of March, one of the chief nuggets among the nuggets, <laughs> Ian Duncan Smith, oh, boo. is coming to Scotland. Let's get him. He's coming to Scotland to speak at the Welfare Reform Scotland Conference in the George Hotel in Edinburgh. All hands on deck. I think, brothers and sisters, hey. you'll see from the motion to read. Let's get to Edinburgh on the 27th of March and give them a reception. They'll never forget. Right. Also on the motion is the proposal that we lobby the Scottish Parliament. Apparently there's a lobby already planned for tomorrow and I wish it well and I hope it goes well. But there is a focus on the 16th of April is when the Govan Law Centre petition calling on the SNP government to amend the Housing Scotland Act. That's when the Petitions Committee will hear that petition. They've written to Mike Daly, spoke to Mike the day he sent me the email for the clerk. They've written to Mike and they've said to him, you won't be invited to address the committee. You may be surprised or even disappointed by this, but we don't always invite petitioners to address their petitions. I can tell you from eight years' experience in the Scottish Parliament that virtually every petitioner that's heard at the Petitions Committee <coughs> is invited to address the Petitions Committee. <coughs> but they've decided not to invite Mike. Well, again, 16th of April, a Tuesday, Scottish Parliament, if they're not going to listen to Mike Daly, let them listen to us. Let us get through there and lobby the Scottish Parliament for the support of a no I'm going to finish, brothers and sisters, as usual, I speak far too long, but the iron chair that we've got here tonight has got a hook out. <laughs> and he's told me to shut up quite uh, rightly and quite properly. I would ask you, brothers and sisters, to look at the motions that you've got in front of you. Look at the message for Dundee. Look at the work that they're doing. Listen to what's happening in other parts of the country and decide that we're going to bring it together. Let's form a West of Scotland federation of anti-bedroom tax campaigns. Let's form a federation that then looks towards April or May of an all-Scotland conference that brings us all together, that says loud and clear, we are going to stand and we are going to fight. And by the way, there is no guarantees. If somebody says to you, oh, you're going to win, there's no guarantees of victory. The only guarantee you've got is if you don't fight, you'll never win. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Tommy. I think that clearly moved the, the motion that you're, you're going to be asking to talk to. John eh, McCargo from the Black Triangle Group, who was one of our speakers today, has now arrived and I know that people will be desperate to, to make some contributions, but I do need to let, to let John in eh, to be fair. So if you could maybe welcome John McCargo. Maybe just a couple of minutes. Here's John.
I mean, it's classic right-wing scapegoating. This big, massive economic crisis was caused, let's not forget, <coughs> everybody who looks into it knows that it was caused on Wall Street by Fr uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, by the repackaging of uh, mortgages. Like, it's all done by financial fraud. Um, what we're being asked as a people to do now is to bail out the, to put everything that I'm saying in, within context, to bail out the bankers. You know, um, the work capability assessment is an offence against every shred of decency that we have in this society. It has, it was started by a company called Unum Provident, an insurance company, a private insurance company that has been advising the UK government um, for about 25 years. And uh, shame on them as well, the <coughs> bastard uh, New Labour government who have like, disgraced the proud tradition that built up the Labour movement. You know, which was a movement of working people when my great grandparents were living in Liverpool, um, and you know when there was disease everywhere, where they had to save up money that they couldn't afford in case they needed to call a doctor. Let's look back at that. This labour, this labour cabal at the front of the Labour Party now is shite, and uh, Liam Byrne is no better. You know, there is a consensus. <laughs> There is a consensus on welfare reform between the Labour Front branch and the, and the Conservatives that we have tried to smash. And the way we've tried to smash it is by exposing the lies <coughs> in the right-wing <coughs> right media about welfare reform. What, am I, what do I mean by lies? <coughs> this pish that, that supposedly there are people you know, who exist in families that were for five generations that never worked. It's a lie. Like, there are so many lies that has become completely blatantly obvious to us, to anyone. You know, this is what the Black Triangle campaign has tried to do for the past three years solidly, is to smash lies and, like, uh, and we've, we've been helped with this with, by the uh, fullfact.org, which is another fantastic non-partisan organisation. You know, so find, you know, we've had, we've all seen the headlines. 75% of sickness benefit claimants are fit for work. The filth, you know, that's printed in the Scottish Sun. You know, our comrade Tommy, you know, has been the victim of such <coughs> filth, you know, from the Murdoch press. And now we see, and now we see what's happening with the Leveson, with the Black Triangle, along with our comrades uh, <coughs> in Disabled People Against Cuts. We put a submission into the Leveson uh, inquiry about all these lies that are going on. Believe me, brothers and sisters, it's going to be another cover-up. They're going to be allowed to carry on doing it. You know why? Because the Tory Party must control. And get all the sheeple to vote for them. <clears throat> so that's been our main thing. The thing about this bedroom tax is that two-thirds of people affected, <coughs> according to Westminster, and 80% according to the Scottish Government, are, are going to be households that contain dis you know, one disabled person. Now, I'm a disabled person myself, I might not look it, but um, I've got clinical depression, um, I get treated for that. Um, and I've been to the Sheriff Court before when I've fallen into in, in Edinburgh. You know, uh, when I've fallen into her ears. And I can tell you that they are savage. Those judges will, those sheriffs will give you short shrift. They don't give a, they couldn't give a monkeys when you're disabled in there. They will evict. The, the, the presumption is to evict people. And I'm saying this, that if they start to try and evict disabled people, then it's a case of we've got to get all get out of our houses. We've got to go down. <coughs> We've got to go down to the sheriff's court and we've got to occupy it. <laughs> this is seriously a time where we've got to stand up and say, <coughs> I'm sorry, I've got a bad, a bad chest. This is seriously a time where we've got 
Like, in my neighbourhood, I'd stay in Morden. <coughs> High rise flats Sorry. in Edinburgh. Thanks. And what I'm doing is I'm organising a local neighbourhood meeting in the local neighbourhood centre, and I'm going around. To, there are five, well, there are uh, six plots of flats. There are 75 flats in each thing. And I'm going around, I'm locking on, you know, every single door, and I'm saying, if you're affected by the bedroom tax, come down to this meeting. Come to this demonstration that we're going to have. This is the kind of work that we have to do, because doing it online is not enough. That is the way for us to communicate with each other, to facilitate, to coordinate, to get what we need to do now is build a mass movement. And that means legwork. That means people who are able, because a lot of people, I'm here as somebody who's representing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, who just cannot go out. So I have to speak for them. And through me, I'm speaking to you tonight, every single one of you. Don't you come to this meeting and just like, let's have a, you know, like slap. We hate the Conservatives. To be quite honest with you, I'm not allowed to say it in public, but if you would give me a machine gun and they were lined up against them, well, I'd fucking kill the lot of them. Hey! <laughs> so what we've got to do is we've got to go out into our communities where we live, our next door neighbours. We've got to get our leaflets. We've got to go around. <coughs> and as soon as there's any attack on disabled people, and let's not make, by the way, any distinction between disabled people and able people, between working people and unemployed people, because we are all of the same class. <coughs> right from the very beginning of our campaign, we have been against neoliberalism. And the only way to defeat neoliberalism is to unite. That means black and white, employed, unemployed, able to... It means disabled people who are disabled physically and disabled people who have mental and uh, other uh, impairments. Any, we don't make a distinction between impairments, and that includes people who have drug and alcohol issues. We, the Black Triangle campaign, according to the symbol, I don't know if you know the history of the symbol, I won't go into it now, look on our website. Like, we were classified as the work shy. And disabled people are anything but work shy. What they give to their communities, what they give to their families, the love and everything like that, we demand to be treated with dignity, every single person in our country <coughs> deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. And we will demand it, not only will, de will we demand it, but we will fight for it until we drive every last fucking Tory out of this country. <laughs> I'm just going to get back to what Tommy was saying before. Basically, he said it all. Sorry I was a bit late. Trains wait. What it is is that, you know, we really need to now mobilise. We need to get more people together. The same goes with it. Black Triangle supports radical independence. The same thing with that. I'm sure if there's people here who <coughs> that, but like, but disabled people is a lifeboat because we cannot see a Labour government that is going to reverse the, the Welfare Reform Act. What we need is we need, at least over this bedroom tax, we can unite on this. Because we all agree, whatever side of the, the, the thing you're on, is that we've got to go and speak to our neighbours, we've got to unite, we've got to get together, we've got to start meeting, we've got to, go, you know, we've got to find time to meet in the evening, we're all working, whatever, to put a stop to this. Because this barbarism, I can tell you what I will end in. I've been in the Sheriff Court, number 13, funnily enough, Edinburgh Sheriff, the Harrisville Court, you know, there's going to be people thrown out in the street who are disabled. And a country, Scotland, cannot allow that to happen. It's not in our history. It's not in our... These are not Scottish values. And so if we're going to stand up for Scottish values, we're going to put our chests out. If we're going to say to our children, those of you who have them, you know, this is what I did when the Tories attacked my society, then this is what we've got to do. Get together now, brothers and sisters. Don't let the people of Scotland down. Don't let disabled people down. Let's show the Tories what we're about. We're about humanity. We're about justice. And we're not going to give up until we beat the bastards. Thanks very much, uh, John. Um, we're going to move on to the period where people can ask questions. Might actually want to make comments.
We also particularly want suggestions.